<laughs> okay, well, uh, good afternoon all. Uh, thank you for attending today. Um, what I wanted to do just, just literally for 10 minutes is just to introduce you to the school, um, give you an idea of the uh, programs and structures of our degree programs and so on, and then move on uh, with our students, giving you a short presentation. And then you go into some deeper um, uh, understanding of various different uh, degree programs following that. So my name is Andrew Thomas, I'm head of the school and our team will take you through now for the next two to two and a half hours uh, about what, what the school is delivering and how you fit into that, um, into that structure for next year. So as I say, what I'll do is just give you a brief overview of the, the uh, quality indicators of the, of the school and the university, a uh, brief touch on typical degree structure. And then the important bit after that is the students, the students' perspective. So we have uh, students um, currently on our programmes, first, second and third year students, that will give you an indication of what it's like to live and work at the university and the school itself. After that, you'll be split into two groups. So the people who do accounting, economics, finance, to go to one, one area, and um, management marketing and tourism to, to go to another area and you'll have a deeper understanding of the actual degree schemes. Okay, so those of you who have attended the open day just before Christmas, you'll probably remember some of these slides. I've got a shortened version of what we had, but it's just to recap on where we were uh, just before Christmas uh, through our open days. So this particular school is a full service uh, business school. In, what that means is that we deliver all the key uh, business um, functions, business disciplines, so accounting, economics, finance, marketing, uh, management or business and management and tourism. So those are the six key disciplines and we have then uh, hybrid uh, courses in between that as well where we mix um, business, finance and so on. We are focused on fostering learning partnerships. It's a very small school. It's much smaller than some of the schools that you'll find in other universities and it's kept that way for that particular purpose. It's small because we want to foster that learning relationships individually with yourselves. Okay, so we don't look at it from a cohort or a class basis. We work individually with people, with students coming through and we work with you continuously over the three or four years that you're here to add value to you so that you maximise the opportunity for your, to, to get the best possible degree outcome. The focus is not only on um, discipline excellence, our, uh, our focus is also on making sure that you uh, have uh, opportunities for employability post the degree programme. So we will look at the developing the softer skills around, uh, around uh, problem solving, leading teams and so on, and we'll have a discussion about that a little bit later. And as a result of that, 97% of our graduates are either in work or further study within six months of leaving their particular course. As I mentioned, it's a small school. We drive to, to, to drive value into, into our particular programs. We keep the, the class sizes small, and th th that, that um, focus is on creating that best uh, boutique business school, a small um, school that's focused on yourselves. As a result of that, and that philosophy, these are the results that we get from our, our work. So the National Student Survey is an annual survey uh, that asks students from all over the UK to rate their uh, university, rate their courses and the, on, on the work on the courses. At risk of the university is uh, top in England and Wales for the overall student satisfaction. And in particular within the school, four out, out of our six core disciplines are second, third, ninth and fifteenth in the UK. If you consider you've got about 160 odd universities in some shape or form without further education colleges providing higher education courses as well, that's pretty impressive. And that is again down to the focus of providing value to individual students and pushing you to, to achieve the best you possibly can. Well, I mentioned there we were top in England and Wales. We're second overall in the UK as well for student experience, only beaten by St Andrews in Scotland at the moment. <laughs> and we will make sure that we're, we're chasing them down as we speak. <laughs> okay, so some of the awards that we've had, the recent one in September 2019 was the uh, Times Award, 
and the bit in the centre is the important thing for ourselves. Um, there were comments and, and citations around our teaching excellence framework, but it's the uh, investment in the uh, improvements to the campus and the, the drive that we have to push uh, you to the stretch of, of our degree and pushing yourselves to maximise your potential and achieve your potential. So in this case it says outstanding levels of stretch in these degree programmes challenging students to achieve their full potential. Uh, new developments in innovation and enterprise campus, the library that has been uh, recently refurbished and so on and those refurbishments and improvements continue uh, throughout, um, throughout your time here. So you would be being taught within the best structures that we can possibly give you. A little bit about um, graduate salaries. The average graduate salary for, 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 for a 20 year old is approximately £26,000 in the UK at the moment. That goes up obviously as you go in age, but for the 20 year old bracket it's about 26000 so all we've got here is a chart that's slightly out of date, it's about two to three years old at the moment, so we could add a percentage onto this as well. So, but if we're looking at uh, our graduate salaries at this particular point, some 60% of our students gain, um, pick up jobs paying 20, 22,000, 20%, 25 to maybe 26, and a further 20% into 30 odd thousand pounds. So when you have a look at our graduate salaries, our students actually come out and earn what uh, somebody in the mid-twenties would potentially earn and that would be within six months of leaving the university. So we're well ahead on making sure that our students um, gain the best possible employment and, and salaries. And for that, the reason why that's the case is because we drive quality into our degree structures. So if you have a look here, Again, 28% of our students have uh, obtained first class honours degrees, 35% gained two ones, so set upper seconds, 34% gained low seconds, and only a small number gained third class honours degrees. And the reason for that is, is that we're constantly working with you. We've tried to find out where your, your boundaries are, and if your boundary is at third class, we will put extra work and drive extra work uh, through yourselves to make sure that you can raise your, your profile and get into a 2-2 bracket. Same, same situation with 2 one and 2-1s to firsts. We will put that energy and effort into working with you to make sure that you get your best degree profile leaving the university. So whilst the technical elements are safe and sound, the other issue that we need to look at is this employability concept and making sure that you're work prepared and that, that employers want to you as graduates when you leave the university. So there are a whole range of different uh, work-based learning opportunities and uh, opportunities to work, uh, employability opportunities to work with companies. They go from here from work experience, extracurricular uh, development, a year out in industry, a uh, year out in business, a year abroad schemes, a whole range of different programs that allow you to split away from your, your um, course, go and do a year abroad and come back to finish off your final year, or you may want to have employability over the summer holidays and, and so on and so forth, and we will work with you on that. The career service will be in later this afternoon and you can have a chat with the careers advisors about how that will actually happen and what, what, what um, you can do to uh, capitalise on that opportunity. But we focus within the school on this issue of graduate competencies. And the gra graduate competencies are the, the, the issues down there at the bottom, the complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others and so on and so forth. It's all the skills that you would need in business when you go off and, and work, <coughs> work for employers. So with that, what we do there is we, that we, we, we set up our coursework, our assignment work, uh, our lectures that, that allow you to undertake um, complex problem solving type exercises, uh, critical thinking exercises and so on. So this is all interwoven within the structure. So you'll pick up those skills alongside the technical knowledge and the content that you have for each individual degree structure. And this is why we have this 97% employability in our, in our particular programs. So as I mentioned, 
The employability side of things is a 10 minute careers presentation later on this afternoon and again an opportunity to speak to the careers advisors about those opportunities um, to work within businesses either on a part time in the sense of, of uh, weekends, um, summer holidays and so on or through the internship scheme a year abroad and so on. Okay, so the next stage is our student presentation. As I mentioned earlier on, we have a number of students here that are going to give you an idea of what it's like to live and work within the university. Okay. Fear not, I'm not the student. <laughs> Just envious that I'm not the student. Okay. Hello everybody, I'm Kirsty Harrison, so I'm a third year accounting and finance student. Um, I'm Jenny McCaffrey and I'm a first year business finance student. And we're just going to talk to you a little bit about what it's like being a student here at Aberystwyth. So Jenny's going to start off just telling you a bit about her fresher experience. So as I said, um, my name is Jenny, I'm from Northern Ireland. Um, I came here at the start of September and did not know one single person at the university, never mind in Wales. So if you're coming by yourself, honestly, don't worry about that. I've got so many more friends here and now than what I actually have back home. So honestly, don't worry about it. Um, I currently live in PJM, which is a uh, student accommodation just across the road. It's five and six people housed in, um, and you literally could be housed with people from all over the world. Like, I currently have got two boys and two girls from all over England. Um, everybody's doing different degrees, so it's not just people that are sp specifically doing the same degree as you. Um, whenever you come to university, obviously, you've got all your different places and stuff, and different activities and stuff that you can do. So when you first come, you've obviously got the student union. So you've got all these different events during Freshers' Week that also helps you to get new, like, your bearings of the place and meet new people. So there's all of them different things, as well as you can go into town and you can meet all the different people in town and different things that the town does in the first couple of weeks of being here. PGM is just across the road, so it takes you about 10 minutes to get into the actual main campus. So it's also really accessible and easy to get to. Everywhere here is pretty much walkable and walking distance, so it's not as if you're miles away from anything. And I think that's that one. So, this is what I was worried about in a break into university, my timetable. I personally came from a sixth form background, so I used to have a, like class time and then having free time in between. University is pretty much the same. You've got your lectures and seminars and your own free time in between for your own learning. Um, your lectures are typical sitting, listening to um, the lecture go through whatever topic that you're doing and taking your own notes and your own understandings. But with your tutorials, it's more interactive learning. So you'll be set like certain work to do and certain research, which you then bring into a smaller group of people. So if you have any problems or any questions, they all be answered whenever you're doing your tutorials. Um, they happen a couple of times a week, depending on what course it is as well. We also have got your personal tutor. So you can have time with them as well, whenever a couple of weeks, you can go and have your meetings with them. It's someone that is, um, you can go and speak to about anything, if you have any problems with your course, about your subjects, any problems at all in general. If they can't help you, they'll try and point you in the right direction to get the right help that you need. So you're never stuck with anything, you always have someone there to give you a hand. And the final things I wish I had known before I actually came to university are that everyone's in the same boat as you, so don't be worried about anything at all or don't be afraid to ask for help or directions or anything. Everybody here is honestly so friendly and willing to help. It's okay to be homesick, the university is a great wellbeing team here, so if you have any problems at all, like about being homesick or anything at all in general. They're so well to help and so friendly, like they're always have an open door. Don't be afraid to talk to new people and join new clubs. We've got so many societies and different sports teams and everything now that you can join. If you've got an interest in something and never had the chance to pursue it, 
universal waste of time to do it. Um, <laughs> everybody in the town looks out for you. You can go into the town by yourself and come home on a taxi with people who live next door to you. You're never by yourself. You always have someone there if you have anything, anything wrong. There's always someone to give you a hand and help you out. And the final thing I wish I had to know before I came here is that Iceland and Tesco both deliver, so you really don't have to carry your shopping up that hill to your accommodation. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so as Jenny said a little bit about lectures and seminars, just um, I just want to talk to you a bit about what they entail. So lectures, you're being like a lecture theatre, not too dissimilar to this one, and it's very much you'll have a lecture at the front and they'll be taking you through the course content and actually you'll be learning about it. Um, and then you'll have seminars, which you will sort of have um, once every couple of weeks for each module. And it will be independent learning that you'll have to go away and do. Some lecturers like you to just do it by yourselves. And then other lecturers will like you to go off and do working groups, um, depending on what uh, degree scheme you've chosen to do. And then you'll come through and they'll talk you through your answers and make sure that everyone's okay and again that is a much smaller group so it's just a way of them making sure that everybody knows what's being covered in lectures and knows what's going on and is happy to then apply that further. Um, we get a lot of support so we have Blackboard and Panopto which are online like an online portal. Um, all the lectures are recorded so if you miss one because you're ill or hungover <laughs> maybe um, then you'll be able to go back and watch that afterwards. And it's really good, especially exam period, where you've done things sort of, I don't know, way back in November and you're now in May and you can't remember everything. You can go back and watch that and make sure you're completely up, up to speed. All your documents and readings normally put up on there as well. So it's just really easy access. Everything's in the same place. Okay, so this is a little bit about how I've been assessed in my third year. So one of the major misconceptions I had doing accounting and finance was that it was just going to be all numbers. And then I came here and realised that actually you tested on a wide variety of skills that are going to prepare you for when you're working. So it really sort of sets you up. So as you can see here, um, I do audit this year and we were given a case study that we had to work through and we had to make sure that... Um, the in-store stock systems were working efficiently and give um, advice on that. Um, I do management accounting, which is this balance scorecard up over here, which is, was a bit more of a creative one, which I quite enjoyed. So we had to go away, we had to look at BP and um, design and create our own balance scorecard to see um, how they their business was running and if they were like on target for like their different profits and look at different sections within their business. Uh, we also do like report styled essays. Um, so this one here was on a human resources topic. So I looked at, um, I think it was PwC and about how they recruit and select people. And then also we do just have um, exams. So uh, the accountant and finance module, for example, is very much you go and you have sit down at a desk and you do a written exam. Okay, so I have spoke to quite a few people today about sort of the work experience that you get offered, and there are quite a few different options you can have. Um, the Year in Employment Scheme, which I'm going to show you a short video on in a minute, is one option which people um, really enjoy doing because you find that it really applies sort of what you're learning to actually what happens in the industry. Um, you also have the options, um, well I'm not sure about other modules, but accounting and finance in your third year. You can do a work placement once a week as a module and then present back at the end of the year. Um, you also have your Erasmus or your year abroad which you can also look into doing. Um, the year in employment you go out sort of between your second and third years. I'm just going to show you this short clip. if it'll play for me. <laughs> no? <laughs> oh, no. 
Oh, that scream. <laughs> Don't worry. In my first year, on my very first day, we had six people stand up in front of us and they had all just come back from placement and they were talking about it and that day I was like, I'm doing placement. I went to career service, they helped me out, they gave me some information about potential employers. So I researched that, you have to do applications, online tests, uh, assessment centres, interviews, we just had to let them know we obviously wanted to do a placement and once we had secured one they just had we just had to sign something and they had to countersign it to say that well, they were letting us go for the year. My placement was with IBM in Portsmouth and I was real estate strategy and operations assistant. About half of my work was involved in the energy side where I worked with the energy manager focusing on uh, getting energy contracts for the next few years, uh, doing uh, charts of, for weekly meetings. Then the other half was on an operations side looking at the whole portfolio, all the locations across the UK, so I travelled quite a bit to each of them. We had to, you know, prepare budgets, scorecards, how we can, any potential areas that we can improve on. But I still had a connection here because um, my personal tutor at the time, she would always email, I would always, you know, send them updates, let them know how I was getting on. I used to send emails saying, I've just finished my six month review, I'm still here, things like that. So it was great that the support was always still there, they knew I was gone. And actually coming back to it, it was right, it was so different because they, they all knew us, they were so happy to see us and they wanted us to, you know, share our knowledge with, um, I think we went to the first years and the second years as well. And we just gave a brief presentation to them about what we had done, things like that. And it was great. I really benefited from it. Okay. Um, so I just want to talk to you a little bit about what life in Abba is actually like. So even though it is a small seaside town, there is loads to do. Um, the nights out here, if you like nights out, there's about three nightclubs, but there are many pubs. There are a lot, a lot of pubs, <laughs> um, if you like that. But there are also loads of other things. So you've got loads of sort of cafes. There's loads of local restaurants to eat out at. Um, you've also got the pier, which has loads of like arcade games and everything. A big um, like snooker room in the back and pool tables and all that. If you enjoy that as well. Um, coming to uni really teaches you sort of valuable life skills without really pushing you too much. I think it's a really nice step between being at home and actually being out in the real world. Um, you can see here this was our Christmas meal which I think we're all very proud of. <laughs> My house did uh, this year. Um, I'm, a, I'm rubbish at cooking and that's been a big thing for me learning how to you know not live just off pot noodles and you know being able to sort of fend for yourself. Um, I think it really sort of hits home how much your parents will do for you. I remember in first year when I first come down with a cold and it was awful because you know you're there dying and usually your parents will cook your food and still do your clothes washing and wash up after you and you've got to do it yourself and you just don't want to get out of bed and just buy your own medicine it's like oh I just phone my mum you know. Um, but you. you you really do get used to it and I'd recommend to anyone uh, who's thinking of uni to go away from home because you pick up these new skills that you probably haven't even considered needing at this point. So, but yeah, Abba is absolutely beautiful. I mean, the weather's been a bit hit and miss today. I think it keeps changing its mind. But um, the beach on a sunny day is absolutely gorgeous. Um, bonfire night actually is one of my favourite nights here night. on the beach. Um, there's loads of clubs and societies and you'll see loads of groups of people out on the beach um, with little bonfires and you know, barbecue. roasting marshmallows <laughs> and yeah, barbecues and it's, it's a really nice atmosphere. Okay, um, so I normally do this presentation with Charlotte who unfortunately isn't here today and she absolutely loves her clubs and societies, she's really into all her sports. Um, here at Abba we've got loads of different sports, so if you like, I don't know, netball, football, rugby, um, and then there's loads of different societies as well, and they range from absolutely anything. Um, so I know some lads off my course have just um, started an investments club, 
and they're planning a trip down to Swansea soon. Um, you've also got things like, I don't know, Harry Potter Club or uh, Cocktail <laughs> Society and yeah, there's loads and Christian Society, I think I was speaking to someone about earlier. So there is endless and if you wanted to make your own as well, that's really easy to do. I think you only need like five people and um, the university help you start that up and it, it's just a really good way. Um, we also have super teams and varsity, so super teams has just happened and that's sort of within Aberystwyth, clubs and societies go against each other and they do all random challenges. Um, <laughs> some of them are a bit, oh gosh, what are you doing? Um, they have like a big mystery event, um, but that's just happened, they do a women's and a men's one and that, that's great fun. And then we've also got varsity which is coming up, which is um, Aberystwyth v uh, Bangor. And that's even more competitive, and people will put teams, and I think, um, I think Bangor won last year, did they? Yeah. So we, we're eager to win this year. So, but yeah, it, it's great fun. So if you, if you like your clubs and societies, definitely get involved, especially in your first year where your workload won't be as full on as your second and third year. If, even if it's something you've never tried before, there's rock climbing and all sorts. It's, it's really great fun. Uh, if you choose to live in university halls as well, you'll get a free gym membership, so you've got free access to the gym and the pool as well. And yeah, so I'm just going to show you a little clip about Varsity from last year, so you can sort of see what that's all about. I got it. <laughs> Aberystwyth is absolutely phenomenal. So as Gemini said earlier, when you start you'll be assigned a personal tutor and this is just someone who you can go and just chat to, it can be about absolutely anything. If you feel like, you know, you don't like your housemates or something along those lines, you can go and there's always support there. Um, if you find you don't like your personal tutor, then you, you're allowed to just swap that. So say if you start and, I don't know, you really like Ian, and you can just go up to Ian and be like, can you be my personal tutor, please? And he'll be like, yeah, sure, well, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want you, go away, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's really easy. Um, but to be honest as well, that being said, you'll have lecturers from your different modules, and they're always very welcoming, even if they're not your personal tutor. Most of them will have like an open door, well, all of them yeah. that I know of anyway. Um, if they're just in their office and the door's open, you're welcome to just go in and have a chat with them about how things are going, or even just talk to them at the end of your lecture and just be like, I just don't quite understand this, or, you know. And they'll also help classes, so if you like, stuck on a question, you can email them and they'll make sure they can prepare like, to go through that with you in your help classes. Um, you've got support from the Student Union and Nightline, which is sort of um, I don't know, say if it's the, the weekend or it's late at night and you're feeling you know, really low or you just need someone to talk to and your housemates aren't up or you don't have your personal tutor there, it's like a sort of a 24-hour helpline. So you literally type in on Google Aberystwyth Nightline and a number pops up and it's just great. Um, I hope it's one of those you hope you never need it but it's great to know that it's there and that bit of extra support I think is really helpful for students. Um, you also get uh, like a student mentor or a student rep and what this is, it, um, you'll be elected or um, at the start of the year so you'll be asked if anyone wants to do it. Um, if you do come here I definitely recommend going for it in your first year because it's a great way to get to know your lecturers and other students as well because people will come to you and ask you about how things are going and they will have regular meetings and they'll ask the students, like, are you finding this module's working fine for you? Are you finding, I don't know, uh, is your timetable okay? 
Are you, is your lecturer putting all the documents that you need on Blackboard? And then anything that's wrong can be brought up and it's fixed pretty quickly then as well. And it's just a really nice sort of bridge between the lectures and the students. Um, when you're living in halls, you have campus security, so uh, if you have any problems with your flat, again, hopefully you never will, but you never know. Uh, we had trouble with like our hobs, and they'll come out and replace it for you, or you know, give you a new kettle. Or even if like you say, I don't know, your neighbours are being really loud and you've got uni early in the morning, they'll come out and they'll help you with that as well, so that's great, bit of support there as well. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us, um, if anyone's got any questions feel free to ask me now, no, don't usually get any now, but um, you can always, oh? Um, other societies, do you have to pay for them or are you like for free? It, yeah, there's usually like a joining fee, uh, but it, it's not normally, it depends, the bigger clubs like football and rugby and netball is usually a little bit more. Uh, but the smaller club clubs, that's so it's usually, yeah, and that'll be for the whole year. And then obviously if you need, like, equipment or whatever. But um, in terms of things like travelling, because a lot of them, you're, like, again, football, netball, they go everywhere. Um, the uni usually puts on coaches and things, so they'll provide that for you. Good question. Anybody else? Thank you for asking a question. It's quite nice to get one. <laughs> but if anyone uh, wants to ask anything later, just come and grab me. I'm very friendly. So is Jenny. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so what happens now is we're going to split you into two groups. If you're in accounting, finance, economics... Uh, we're going to move you to a different room. If you're management, business and management, marketing and tourism, we're going to keep you in this room. Now, the last time we did this, I did an account, and I don't know what happened on the count, but we ended up with three people left in here for management, marketing and tourism, and everybody else leaving. So I hope I've got the count right this time, but I may not have. So if you're accounting, finance or economics, you need to go to room C4. Are you going to... Kirsty will take you to C4, okay? I'm Jenny. I'm Jenny, brilliant. C4, yeah. It's, it's about a 50 50 split this time, thankfully. And suddenly again. It's not a 50 50 split again. Yeah, exactly. Good thing you're not doing the quick time. I did it again. Yeah. So I don't know what happened right at the end of the game. Apologise to Meg for me. Oh, I didn't Oh dear, am I in trouble? Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. I think I've probably had a chance to, to chat with most of you. Uh, it's always delightful when. Um, I sit listening to students present and you think that was fantastic and then on this occasion I have the dubious honour of trying to follow that type of presentation so I feel completely sort of in, incapable of delivering something of that quality but I will try. Um, what we intend to do over the next 40 minutes is to take you through a typical um, sort of structure of degree programmes. Um, for business and management, marketing and tourism. And what we're going to try and do, we're going to have five to seven minute periods where the tourism person, Mandy, will be able to talk to you about uh, tourism management, the degree structure. And Sophie will be talking to you about the business and management degree structure. And I, I'm a marketer, so I'll be talking to you about the marketing structure. But I'm going to give you a bit of an overview as well of, of what we do and, and how we do things. So the contents of this particular presentation will be an overarching introduction, which I've just pretty much delivered. I'll take you through the the structure of a degree and I'll try and explain to you the way it's been designed and why it's been designed the way it has. Uh, I'll take you through the major degree pathways uh, including the new degree schemes that we've got coming on stream in the next six months. And then what I hope to do near the end and I don't run out of time is I'm going to take you through some examples of recent graduates to show you what they're doing 
two years after graduation. So what typically happens is that six months after graduation, um, our students are in employment, but then they tend to move quite quickly. Within the next 12 or 18 months, they've moved again. Um, and um, so things develop very, very quickly. I think Kirsty and Jenny did a good enough job of explaining to you the facilities that surround. And if you were brave enough or stupid enough to follow my advice of having a quick campus tour at quarter past 12 today, you've kind of seen the sort of the library environment, you've seen the sports environment, and you've seen Aber Union. Basically what, you've, what you'd have walked around is actually Aberystwyth University. We don't have another campus. We are a single campus university, uh, which means typically it takes you no more than six minutes to get between one lecture and another lecture, even if they're at different ends of the campus. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very compact environment, very different to a city camp, a city university where sometimes you can spend 45, 50 minutes just trying to get between buildings on different sides of the city. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to design into success into your degree structure. And one of the ways that we do this is that we follow a, a, something called a common first year. Now the idea behind a common first year is that we provide every student of the business school with exactly the same content. We allow economists and accountant and finance specialists to do an additional module because they need to be more specialised going into their part two, their second year. Um, but for management, marketing and tourism, uh, we have a very general overview to our, to our first year. And it's really simple. All you have to do is get 40% in five modules or more. There's six modules in a year and it's past proceed. Now, we wouldn't be very satisfied if you're only getting 40% in each module. We're going to be pushing you to try and achieve much better grades than a, a straight sort of pass. Uh, but the important point is we're trying to get you to the point where you can move into part two um, and actually start scoring some big, big scores on your assessments. So the idea behind it is you have a solid foundation for your second and third year education. Uh, the second and third years, basically, the second year is worth 33% of your degree, the third year is worth 66% of your, uh, your final degree, and they both count towards your degree classification. So we want to get, we want to iron out any of your learning sort of impediments or to help you find what you're really good and how you really approach things effectively early on in the first year so that when you start going into the second and third year um, your marks are as high as they possibly can be. As a department, as a school, we recommend that you do a year in employment scheme. You've seen us push it, we've probably talked to you individually about it. Would anybody like to hazard a guess what percentage of our students actually go on a year in employment scheme? Yeah, it's 90 10 percent. So we're desperately trying to push our students away at the end of year two. It's like, you know, please some of your parents might be doing similar with you at the minute. Um, but we just can't get them to leave. That doesn't mean that we give up. It just means that only 10% of our students actually do that year in the employment program. We would strongly recommend you do it. They're so happy when they're here, they just don't want to leave the cohort for a year. So we recommend it, but we can't sort of force it. We do also have a foundation degree. It's called Year Zero. Uh, if, for example, a student doesn't do particularly well in their level three studies, it's there as a way of building the confidence back up. Because what we normally find is that students who don't do well at A-level or BTEC National, it's not because they've necessarily got a lack of ability, but for some reason they lose their confidence. And when, it, when universities then put them into year one, you then have that problem with them not having the confidence to, it, to feel that they can progress as we would want them to. So we do have a four-year uh, degree scheme, a year with foundation course. Currently about 15% of our students take that particular option. Okay, We'd much rather people be coming in where they feel comfortable and progressing through. At the end of the day, we're all about making sure that if you start, you finish. We have about a 1.5% dropout rate. It's tiny. I mean, it's utterly tiny. If you go to Greenwich University in London in the first year, they get a 29% dropout rate. 29 students out of every 100 gone before the end of the first year. So we, we try to minimise that, and so that's part of the structure. The way a degree works is that you'll have modules, and, and Mandy and Sophie, they deliver certain types of modules. They're module specialists, myself as well. And you can probably tell I'm so old that I can cover most modules, so I can pretty much teach most of the things. But the point is that you'll be taught by a subject specialist, and you'll have six subject specialists a year. 
So you'll be doing six modules every year. You'll do three in the first semester, three in the second semester. You'll get examined at the end of your first semester, or assessed, and you'll get examined or assessed at the end of your second semester. Typically, you will do a 45-55 split of examinations and assessments across your degree scheme. Okay? Uh, accountant finance is a little bit higher, but you're not accountant finance people, so it's not a problem. Some of the modules that you take are core. We insist that you take them. Why? Because they're foundational elements for your degree scheme. So they're core. You have no option in taking them. Some are elective. You will choose them. Now, separately, with several people, I've already explained that the electives we have are very narrow, and they're narrow for a reason. When you graduate from, with a degree in management, marketing, tourism management here from Aberystwyth University, what we've done is we've condensed what the typical employers want out of a graduate output. So instead of doing, giving you 15 or 16 different options, where well you end up with a degree that looks like a pack of jelly babies, you know, it's all sort of very mixed. We make sure that you deliver out the core requirements that the business, our customers, our customers are the industry and employers um, that you will get your employment with. Andrew mentioned this, we have, a, we're a main, um, a full service provision business school. So we cover every single discipline. Class size is typically in year one, the maximum class size will be 75 or 80. In year two, your maximum class size will be 55 or so. Uh, in marketing, some of the specialist classes are 15, 18, 20. Tourism management's the same. So they're quite small class sizes. I was speaking to a colleague who works in a university in the Midlands area um, of England. I'm not going to name it. And I said, how's it going? He said, I've got a bit of a nightmare, Ian. What's the nightmare? I've got a module, 120 credit module, 1,800 students. So how do you teach it? This, this room carries about 120 students, OK? How do you teach it? He said, well, it goes through four or five lecture theatres, depending on what's going on, what's available. And he said, I stand in front of one, and a disembodied voice gets delivered to the other four rooms. So the students are paying. So he said, what happens in the tutorials and seminars? Are tutorials and seminars maximum 25? Uh, what happens in the tutorials and seminars? All oh, there's between 200 and 250 in the class, depending on how many people turn up. How do you deliver that? And he's, so basically, his whole teaching is one module. That's it. One 20 credit module. So what we tried to do is we tried to make sure that because of this, the size that we are, we are quite a small business school, which means that we typically know you. Okay? Um, these are the typical discipline areas. At the end of the first semester, you can switch anywhere in the business school. At the end of the second semester, you can switch within AFE or MMT. Okay? So at the end of the first year, if you started off in MMT, you're guaranteed. But if at the end of the first semester you say, look Ian, I think I'm really quite interested in accounting and finance, we would recommend that you did the specialist accounting and finance module. That would allow you to swap if you wanted to at the end of your first year. Okay? There's lots of dialogue going on to make sure that this happens. So we have been evolving. Our, our, our programs are evolving. Um, you can see two there, which are obviously market driven. Any ideas what you think the market driven ones there are? What happened in Bristol yesterday? Greta? Yeah. And what we've seen is that we basically, we're, we're a very environmentally sort of aware organization. And we can see where there's a direct association between climate change and business and climate change and economics. And what we're doing is we're just sort of adding a, a minor specialism to a straight single honours degree scheme to allow people to understand what the impacts of climate change and economics or climate change in business are. Because at the end of the day, what comes out of business schools are the leaders of the developed and developing worlds for the next 30 or 40 years. What we do in university fundamentally impacts the direction of travel of the societies within which we work. So we have a responsibility to make sure that they, um, they are delivered in a authentic and ethical manner. So you, your first, common your first year, uh, understand the economy, fundamentals of accounting and finance, fundamentals of management and business. These are the two specialist subjects for economics and for a and F, okay? Data analytics, um, quite a lot of data manipulation. Very, it's very well taught um, because lots of students don't like manipulating data. 
Uh, but what we know is everybody in business has to manipulate data. There's no getting away from it. Everything is driven by data. All decisions that we make commercially. It used to be hunch when I was a young person. Now show me the statistics. So what we're going to do is I'm going to let um, you have the opportunity to listen. It's, I think it's good to sort of hear about subject disciplines from people who teach the subject disciplines because I'm passionate about marketing and whilst I thoroughly enjoy tours of management and I also thoroughly enjoy business and management, it's not my subject discipline, it's not the thing that I'm ultimately passionate for. So Sophie's going to give you a, um, a five to seven minute chat now about the overarching structure of the business and management degree, okay? Okay. Okay, so this gives you an idea of uh, how we structure our management and business degree. So Ian mentioned uh, subject specialists. In management business, as in uh, our other areas, we have certain people who specialise in certain things. So for example, uh, we have people who either have uh, specific practical knowledge, practical experience, or people who have an interest in and their research background is in a particular area. So uh, we have um, one of our staff members, uh, so um, Wynne Morris is a strategist, he's uh, experienced in strategy. My area uh, is in resources, specifically in human resource management, in organisational psychology. So that's my uh, subject specialism in terms of that's the research that I'm interested in, that's the topic I'm interested in, but my practical experience is in project management. So you can see at the top we've got leadership, and that's obviously key because that's in the title. We've got business and management. So leadership is a core part of the business and management scheme. It relates to all of the different areas. So leadership is one of the things that I would teach. It comes into HR, it comes into organisational psychology. Uh, but it's also important in terms of finance, technology, operations, marketing resources and supply chain management. So the reason that you might be interested in business and management uh, is because you want an overview of uh, how a business might run and you want to think about how you might fit into a business environment. So you might need to have but may not be hugely interested in finance for example. So our courses are tailored to people who need to have that experience but who are not necessarily going to go on to be accountants. Uh, you might have an interest in operations management, you might be interested in supply chain management, but you do not necessarily know that that's a specific area that you want to go into. So our courses uh, relate to these different areas, but these are the modules. Okay? So you get an overall view of what uh, would be involved in business and management. So when you finish our courses, you go out into the world and you can say, okay, I have experience of finance, I have experience of operations management, I've done some project management, I understand HR. So you have experience or understanding of all of these different areas that then will help you when you look for a job because you can say, well, actually, I did a HR course. I'm really interested in that. You might then decide I want to go straight into HR or I might want to go on and do a master's specialising in that particular area. So I now have a management business degree with HR. So I am now more of a HR specialist, for example. Um, the other thing that we look at is uh, entrepreneurship. So um, in Aberystwyth, we have a uh, entrepreneur, or we are considered to be an entrepreneurial hub. So we work very closely with the careers um, department to uh, to encourage people to uh, develop their own ideas, their own creativity. So uh, students will come to us and say, "I've got this really good idea. You know, I want to develop a business plan for X, Y, and Z. You know, I've thought about doing this business." And we're able to help them do that. And we also try to put that into some of the courses. So, for example, we tend to do uh, reports as well as essays, which means that we ask people to look at how their work in advance might align with their modules that they're looking at now. So, if you're interested in HR, you might want to do a report looking at a HR um, area of a company, for example, which is uh, one of the modules that I would teach. Happy? That's right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Good day. Hello, everyone. So I'm Dr. Mandy Tolbert, and I'm responsible for the tourism management programs here. 
Uh, so we actually have four programs. We have straight tourism management. We've got tourism and marketing, which I believe this lady here is interested in. We have adventure tourism and tourism and languages. Okay, so we've got four different schemes. So what I'm going to do today is just give you an overview of what we cover on the degree scheme to give you a flavour for the course. Um, and obviously we like to have models to hang our ideas off that we, we have a look at on the course. Does anyone recognise this model? Can anyone tell me what it is? This is Butler's Tourism Area Life Cycle Model. Um, he de developed this back in the 80s, but it's still very relevant today. And generally, a tourist destination will follow this cycle. So you can see that over time, basically, you've got a growth in tourist numbers and up until you reach kind of a, a stagnation stage where tourist numbers level off. This is where we have what we call mass tourism, high numbers of tourists all spending a low amount of money at a destination. Somewhere like Benidorm might fit this criteria. But once tourist destinations reach this stage, they tend to go out of fashion a little bit. And this is where tourism management comes in. You see a lot of resorts go into decline, like seaside resorts in the UK. Others, you see, enter a kind of rejuvenation stage in order to prolong the economic activity of the area and make it sustainable in the um, long run. So you get schemes such as um, event programmes, conferences, music venues, venues, aquariums, art galleries. I'm from Margate, so, so we've got a, a Tracy Ermin gallery down there. Um, and then you also got the rejuvenation of stagnant or, or dying economies uh, through tourism, as you see in North Wales, with the growth of the adventure tourism industry in the, in the quarries. Um, you've got the zip lines and the bounce billows and slate mining museums to help preserve the heritage of a destination. So yes, so you can see that tourism planning and management is very important uh, to a destination, so that it, it can be economically sustainable in the long term. Now, I don't know, that, does anyone know how big the tourism industry actually is? Any guesses? Well, it's one of the world's largest industries. Um, figures show that it contributes to 10% of the global GDP. It's rapidly grown, 5% year on year since the 1990s. So every country, every destination wants a slice of that to grow their economy. Any idea what international tourist arrivals are forecast to be this year? 1.6 billion. But remember, tourism is a volatile industry and we're unlikely to reach those figures now that we've got the coronavirus disrupting um, tourism. So, so tourism comes with a big caution as well. Um, you've probably seen headlines in um, the newspaper in recent years about the idea of over-tourism and anti-tourism. You've probably seen things such as tourists go home, tourist protests in places like Barcelona, Venice, Dubrovnik, popular heritage centres where people are getting overrun with tourists and, and they don't like it. So these are kind of issues that we tackle on the scheme. We look at why there are too many tourists and how we can prevent or manage these problems. Ian mentioned climate change. This is a hot topic at the moment. So we look at how destinations are struggling with that, rising sea levels, shorter ski seasons, bleaching coral, melting ice caps. So again, we look at how destinations are adapting to this. Other destinations, places like the Gambia, they're becoming more and more reliant on tourism as incomes from agriculture falls. Um, and tourism is a great tool for poverty reduction. So we look at how tourism can be used to alleviate poverty. Um, Adventure tourism, this is one of the fastest growing sectors of the adventure tourism market and many less developed regions and less developed economies are looking to capitalise on this. And this is great because we've got a great number of, well, a great growth in the number of hardy tourists, adventure tourists, people wanting to get off the beaten track. So you places like Brazil, the Amazon, Africa, Nepal can cater for tourists such as this. 
through the um, what they can offer in terms of natural heritage, mountains, jungles, and traditional cultures. But obviously, if you send tourists to these fragile places in large numbers, they have the potential to have negative impacts. So again, this needs managing. Um, and also, if you're sending tourists off to remote environments, you've got risks of getting lost, getting eaten by big animals, or whatever. So you also have to look at managing the risk um, when you're planning your tourism activities. So you can see tourism covers quite a large area. Okay. So yes, basically to conclude, we can see that tourism can bring a lot of economic benefits and development benefits to destinations, but if it is to be economically sustainable in the long run, it needs to be carefully planned for and managed at all stages of the tourism area life cycle, whether it be at the inception and growth stage or mass tourism stage. Okay, And so this is where you come in. One of your final modules on the course is looking at the development strategies of different destinations. And you know, at the end of the course, you're pretty good at tourism uh, and you are looking at advising countries on what they should do next. Next. So we really try to get you thinking um, as a strategist about where different destinations should go. Um, you can see a few titles of modules on the screen here. These are the names of modules that you will study in the second and final year of the degree scheme when you go to specialise a little bit more in your desired area of study. And we deliver these modules for a combination of classroom-based learning, expert speakers, and we have a, well, day field trips, but we have overnight field trips each year. In North Wales in year one, to look at regeneration and adventure particularly. Year two, we go to Malta, um, we have a look at mass and alternative tourism. And in the final year, we send you to a destination show where you can do your own research about how tourist destinations are marketing themselves at different stages of this tourism area life cycle. So you'll see this model a lot when you're studying tourism. Um, it's important to note also that all of our tourism degree schemes are externally accredited with the Tourism Management Institute. And basically this means our schemes meet the needs of industry, both in terms of what we cover on the course, so they like what we cover, and also the skills that we develop in our students as well. Okay. And finally, you probably want to know what the tourism students are doing now, don't you? <laughs> okay, so this year we've had some students go on to graduate training schemes, ones with enterprise cars, and if anyone likes driving fast cars, he's enjoying it because he gets to drive lots of different cars. Uh, we have an entertainment manager on Carnival Cruises, and she's posting Facebook pictures of her time in the Caribbean, making some of her peers rather jealous. We have resort reps and managers. We have students working in travel agents and tour operators in the UK and overseas. One or two have gone into local government to help with planning of tourism there. Some students have gone on to do masters or PhDs and take their studies further. One girl uh, a few years back went to Disney World in Florida because she wanted to develop her CV in well, attraction management, and clearly Disney World's the place to go if you want to learn about attraction management. Um, and we've also had a student running their own business um, in recent time. It's an events business, um, and um, well, she's into uh, running scare events, and, and you know this is a growing market, zombie scare events. So, so uh, yes, so she's taken her own interests um, and, and, and applied them uh, to the events market. So there we are. In a nutshell, this is a tourism programme and um, I'll be happy to talk to you again later if you've got any more questions. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Yes. I think it's always good to see sort of um, what people are doing. Uh, universities are moving towards something called sort of active learning. Um, what we particularly do in, in marketing and tourism is we have an awful lot of active activities which we learn through and I know that Sophie's modules in particular in business and management also have an awful lot of acting. They like to put you in situations where you have to explore the reality rather than the, the perception of reality that academic literature can often sort of advise you of. Uh, and here's just a, a sort of a montage of pictures from a, a trip to Malta and Gozo I think from last year. So that leaves you with me. Um, I'm Ian. I look after marketing, digital marketing um, anybody who's doing a level three business studies, 
program at the minute. Hazard a guess what that is? See, I know all of you know the answer. Uh, the cash cow one. It's the Boston Consulting Group matrix, the BCG matrix. Um, and you've probably guessed, I put this presentation together, you've probably guessed I'm a marketer, I quite like visual metaphors. I think it's much easier to use a diagram to explain a, a complex environment. Uh, and I think Sophie and Manny's done a great, great job of actually explaining what they do as a discipline through a model. And that's one of the things that we want you to do when you're here. It's not just a case of understanding that something is the BCG matrix, is what can you do with it, how is it used? Uh, and that's part of the, the way that when we put graduates in front of future employers, they can articulate these things in a much more deeply understood manner than some of the contemporary, contemporaries that are going with them. In fact, we know this to be the case because we have employers coming back to us that are telling us that our graduates are six to nine months more productive when they start with those companies than students from other universities. So this is the BCG matrix, and I just thought it was a nice metaphor to explain what marketing was. And really what marketing is trying to do is it's trying to change your behaviour. Fundamentally, what I do professionally, I used to be a, all marketers within the department of practitioner marketers, we've all practiced marketing, and we're all academic doctors. Um, and what we try to do is we try to say, okay, this is what happens. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, for want of a better word, manipulate your behavior. I'm trying to get you to think that a product is better than the competition. And that's really quite difficult because Andrew alluded to this. There's 170 plus universities offering degrees. I think there's about 150 of that offer business and management capabilities. So this is an active market. So we're in a competitive environment. So what do marketers do? Well, the first thing that we have to do, and what drives everything that you've done in your life today, or your parents' lives today, is this idea of consumption. Everything that happens is driven by consumption. Everything. I dare you to find me something that isn't driven by consumption. Some of you say religion in, yeah? Okay, that's definitely driven by consumption. Okay? Because you're consuming an idea. And somebody's articulating that idea to you in a way that resonates and, and is believable to you. So when we think about consumers, what we're thinking about is how and why do you behave in a certain way? Why do you form groups with people? Why do you choose to align yourself to certain groups? What impact does the family have on your consumptive practice? Sad story. I go to my parents' house. I'm very lucky both my parents are still alive. I go in the bathroom, they've got coal tar soap. If you've ever smelt coal tar, coal tar soap, it's the most hideous smelling thing. It just makes me feel like a child again. So those familial ties have actually led to some sort of fundamental change in my behaviour. Because it's soap. Why would I have any emotional attachment to the smell of soap? And that's what we try to do in consumer behaviour. We try to say, look, what is it about you that creates motives in the way that you motivate yourself? How do you perceive things happening? I teach consumer behaviour in this room. And the first thing I'll say to them when I start talking about perception is tell me what's the most common image on the wall of this room? Don't look. How many people have even looked at the imagery around the edge of this room? Um, yeah, okay, good. What's the most common one? <laughs> but that's the point. The point is you're in an environment here, and this environment is a fixed environment. How many people recognize that the seats in the middle are a different color than the seats on the edge? Okay, so some people perceive things, and some people don't perceive things. So my job as a marketer is to get you to perceive me, and why this product is better than other products. And to do that, I have to know what your motives are, I have to know what your attitudes and how you form attitudes, I have to help you memorise things. If I said the word beans means, how would you finish the sentence? What's all that about? <laughs> yeah, that's just classical conditioning. So we use these strap lines and these different activities to actually change your behaviours. Because when you think of beans, you think kind. Yeah, in the same way that when you think of probably mobile devices and mobile telephony, mobile phones, you probably think Apple. Why? What is it about Apple that does that? So that's consumer behaviour in a nutshell. Uh, what else have we got over here? Innovation, creativity and intuition. Lovely story. How many people here have got an iPhone? Hands up if you've got an iPhone. Some of you have got an iPhone. How many of you have got an iPhone 7 onwards? 
Okay, what do you know about the iPhone 7 onwards when it comes to headphones? They don't have a jack, do they? Yeah, you have to use a lightning adapter. Now, what, what does that mean? What's that got to do with innovation and creativity? Well, Apple have managed to create a multi-billion pound market as a result of ditching that particular cable. Apple owns 74% of the wireless headphone market. 74. 74 out of every 100 wireless headphones are Apple. Now, can you tell me how much a pair of Apple AirPods are? £150, typically, okay? They own 74% of the market and they generate $5.5 billion annually. Now, if they hadn't removed the headphone jack, they wouldn't have that business. Okay? So what are they doing? They're looking at how they can manipulate consumers by using their brand. So now we're talking about brand. Well, brands are a way of reassurance to you. The simplest way to explain what a brand is, is it's a promise. If I buy this Uniball pen, I kind of assume that it's going to have a life expectancy, a feel when I write, and my writing might actually be legible, unlikely, but might be. So the brand promise of Apple has managed to persuade lots of consumers to spend £150 on AirPods because the brand symbolically, and you know this because you'll be in schools and colleges, and as you're walking around you'll see people with little white points sticking out of their ears, and that's all driven by innovation and creativity. They recognize it. Are you aware that the Apple Watch is now the largest share percentage of luxury watches in the world? They've overtaken Rotel, it's not Rotel, Rolex, Longines, Tag Heuer, collectively. They sell more revenue of smartphones than the rest put together. Okay? So marketers generate demand, but also we try to make you purchase things, and we also try to form relationships with you. And one of the ways that we communicate with you is through advertising. And advertising is great because it means that I can reach a mass audience very quickly. But what do your generation do that my generation don't do? You don't watch TV. So now how do I reach you? Well, I know how to reach you, I just use YouTube because that's where you're going to spend your time. And that's where I'm going to see messages. But now instead of broadcasting to you, I'm no longer broadcasting, I'm narrowcasting. Because your interests on YouTube are completely different to your interests on YouTube, which are completely different to your interests on YouTube. But I can rely on Google. Google is a media company. You think it's a search engine, don't you? It's not, it's a media company. It's just like ITV. It's ITV for 2020. That's what Google is. And Facebook. They're just a way of getting a message to a large audience. So that's... I'm not going to go on any longer. That's kind of like a little overview into what marketing is um, and why I personally think that marketing is a fantastic career. Management of business, um, underwritten by the Chartered Management Institute. So you leave here as char char Chartered Managers. Marketing, Chartered Institute of Marketing. You leave here as level four or possibly a level six if you do additional examination. We like our graduates to leave us with more than just the degree. Okay? So there's employability skills and then there's those blue ribbon wrapper elements, what are known as augmented attributes in marketing. I'm not going down that route, it's really boring. That's what your typical study week's like. I thought that Kirsty and Jenny did a pretty good example of what that's like. Okay, it might not be 40 hours. Some people work 15, 20 hours a week. Some students work 80, 90 hours a week in total just trying to get everything done. What we know is that in Aberystwyth we've got a large quantity of very, very hard working students. But you can see how you would distribute your time. They've also discussed all the support mechanisms. It's no accident that we have been the top university for student satisfaction experience for year after year with a blip in the middle. And the managers could explain that way. Not the managers here, but the managers of the university could explain that way. The reason for that is there's four or five different mechanisms which you've got an issue with anything. We know about it as soon as you tell us. And we are expected to answer that issue within a 12-hour window. 
So anything happens, you need something, some more advice on something, it's there. We cover lots of other areas. Lecture capture, prime example. Uh, since one o'clock today, we've been recording this session. Every single lecture that goes in here is recorded. Disembodied voice, because I'm nowhere near the camera, obviously. Uh, disembodied voice, but this whole activity has been recorded. That's accept that's um, I can't think of the right word. You're, you can access that at any point at any time. Oh, you can't see that, can you? Sorry, you're just wondering what... There you go. Okay, this is how we record things. Where do our students typically go? They go just about everywhere. There's very few places that they can't or don't end up. Um, I used to play a game in the open days. I play a, a sort of like a brand game, and it's like which of these... Which of the top 20 graduate employers don't take a student from us? And uh, it's quite a nice game. Um, the bottom line is our graduates get placed just about everywhere. And what we tried to do uh, was we tried to help our students identify where that might be for them. Because part of a degree is understanding what, what excites you, what makes you passionate. You know, why you'd want to persist with something. The bottom line is that anybody who's 18 or 20 now, you're typically, unless you're very successful, going to be working until you're 70. And you're likely to have multiple careers in that age, in that time span. So what we try to do is we try to make sure that we give you these transferable skills and competences that allow you to facilitate those transitions. Like these have been filched, pinched off LinkedIn. And they're uh, some of my recent students. These are all marketing students. Uh, this is Hannah. I did a four-year degree with us, spent the third of her fourth year over four years in Australia. Uh, she works with a company called McGregor Boyle. That's not where she started working. This is a, a great example. Uh, she used to push us really hard. She's just one of those characters who just constantly be pushing us, asking, and sort of trying to get the most out of things. About 18 months ago, she was asked by that company to try. There was a competition. We need to find new revenue streams. She won the competition. She was given about a million and a half pounds to develop that business stream. She's just told me that she's been made head, 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 headhunter for that company. She graduated in 2016, 2017. So she's earning probably more than the three academics that you've got in front of you at this minute. Okay, um, Incredibly successful, never in any doubt. And what's lovely is every time I speak to Hannah, it's Ian, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Would you like me to do this for you? I can, if you want me to, I can Skype in and deliver part of a lecture for you. And, and that's what we try to do here. We try to, de to develop these sort of relationships which, which go on. This is Dan Phoenix. Uh, Dan's, this is Cookie Media. Dan's moved on. Dan now works for the world's largest media advertising sort of services company. Um, I wrote him a reference about seven, eight months ago. What he's doing there is he's talking a series of customers. They're paying about £450, £500 each for that session. He's 18 months out of his degree and he's talking them through visual merchandising. If it's visual merchandising, what social media mechanism do you think he's instructing them in? Instagram, correct. Okay, so he's delivering Instagram skills to organizations to just so they understand how they use visual metaphors more effectively. This is Ebbs. Ebbs started the degree. He started accounting and finance. He didn't like accounting and finance, accounting and finance liked him even less. So at the end of his first year, he transferred over into marketing. Uh, he worked for Everything Everywhere, a BT owned company. He worked for Everything Everywhere while he was here. He's now a strategy and project delivery graduate, so he's on the graduate scheme with, with Everything Everywhere. He's going to go far because he's just got one of those charismatic personalities. Uh, what we've seen so far is a lot of B2C stuff. Uh, and this is a B2B example. This guy looks after an account for Rekit Bankiser. I think one of the things he looks after is a well-known black currant drink, which I always find quite amusing. But he, he helps organisations buy millions of pounds worth. So he's a trade marketing manager for Rekit Bankiser. Okay, he's a business relationships, a key account manager, what would be known as a, a bow tie manager in the old trade parlance. And I think this is probably the most exciting job, uh, I personally think. Um, Alex is a go-to-market consultant. Uh, does everybody here know what a unicorn is? 
a union, not, not the mythical unicorn. Okay, in investment circles, when a company starts up and it's got a market valuation, a high market valuation, but bugger all revenue, it's known as a unicorn, okay? Because it doesn't really exist. The company's worth all this money, but it really hasn't got any customers. And she helps unicorns or potential unicorns go to market. So she provides them with a business startup consultancy. So it's not just her, she's part of a team. Um, she's a bit too inexperienced at the minute to be doing it all. Um, all she's doing is she's helping business startups in central London um, actually deliver outcomes. So these are some of our typical graduate stories. And we're very proud of what these people have achieved. And it's not because of what we do, it's about how we do it together. All we can do is provide a professional environment and provide you with the opportunities. What we want students of Aberystwyth, Aberystwyth University, and especially the business school to do, is bring your passion and enthusiasm to us. And what we will desperately try to do is make sure that you take it as far as you can. And we work very, very hard in making sure that happens. Okay, just a brief recap. I can't believe we're actually almost on time. I'm only three minutes over. This is miraculous. Um, quality indicators. We, we've got fairly good quality indicators. I'm not going to keep on slamming it down your throat. The fundamental point is these aren't the Mickey Mouse ones. Okay? Cardiff University classes itself as one of the most beautiful cities in the United Kingdom to study at. Why? Because they can't say that the Times has ranked them number one, number two, number three. So they just say we are the most beautiful place in in the country, okay? These are high quality blue ribbon rewards. Degree programs, they all have professional or chartered outcomes, they all have exemptions. Career and personal development, hopefully our student ambassadors will have articulated what we do. Employability, 8% above the UK business school average. Now our business school is very different than most business schools. Our business school is full of people around about the 18 to 23 age range. Most business schools are full of 30, 35 year olds who are coming in there from industry. So the very, very fact that we're outperforming them by a large amount says a great deal about the quality of the service that we deliver. And all I can say is thank you ever so much for sitting in the cold room for the best part of an hour and a quarter and listening to us. What happens now is the parents are going to come to one group and the students are going to go and do a business game um, and then we will reconvene at three o'clock. There will be an opportunity for students in C43 to have a careers presentation. At the end of the parents activity there will also be a careers presentation so it will be something similar going to both. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, that's like a typical class. You know, I, I, talk, I talk for the best part of an hour and 15 minutes and say, okay, all right, let's go. So, yeah, so if you go, uh, C4 for the parents, C43 for the students, okay, or potential students. And thank you ever so much for listening.